Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shaw Sprague. I am the Vice President of Government Relations for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Trust Government Relations uh, team regularly collaborates with our Preservation Forum, uh, Leadership Forum colleagues, and today we're pleased to uh, produce relevant and timely public policy content for the preservation community. Our topic today is ensuring historic properties in an increasingly challenging marketplace, what you need to know. So our focus will be the state of the current insurance marketplace as it relates to historic properties, the severe challenges historic property owners face, both residential and commercial, what is driving these market changes, and what, if any, changes might be on the horizon. Uh, first, though, let me note that Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust, and this webinar is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum. So we want to extend our deep thanks to our forum members that are with us today. And as a reminder, forum members who are attending this webinar are eligible to receive a free consultation from the National Trust Insurance Services. This is a benefit of forum membership and you'll be receiving an email uh, from us tomorrow explaining how you can get access to this uh, special opportunity. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at forum at savingplaces.org. Uh, but we look forward, but look forward to an email from forum tomorrow with details about uh, this consultation. Uh, the last 36 months have proven to be an extremely challenging time, both for the commercial and homeowner insurance industries. Pricing has increased significantly in many areas of the country, and the reasons for these challenges, as well as the misperceptions surrounding these challenges, will be the subject uh, of this webinar. So before we begin, just a few logistical notes to convey. Uh, we will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Please send the questions via, via the Q&A function uh, directly to the panelists. And of course, you're welcome to submit at any point during the webinar, uh, but we will we'll be waiting for the Q&A section to answer questions. Uh, and I'll note at the outset that we received literally hundreds of questions, uh, pre-questions pre to the webinar. So we, we will be working through those first. Uh, and uh, please, uh, as we move through the webinar, communicate with partner uh, participants through the chat function. In terms of format, we have designed this to be more of a panel-based discussion uh, with slides, uh, with not too many slides. So let us know what you think of the format. Uh, it is closed captioning, uh, is enabled for this webinar, and following the program, we will send out a recording of the webinar directly to the email that you use to register. Uh, and finally, all forum webinars are available uh, on our National Trust YouTube channel. So with that, we are extremely grateful to have a very talented panel with us today who interface with property insurance in different ways. Uh, and it's this diversity of perspectives that we are excited to share with you today. So first, I'd like to introduce Megan Elliott. Megan has dedicated her career to historic building redevelopment and is the principal and founder of Jill Pine, New History, and Revitalized Minnesota. Next, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Cherry Farmer. Stephanie has joined the, sta joined the staff of the Georgia Historic Preservation Division, the Georgia's State Historic Preservation Office in 2013, and is the Director of Office of Documentation and Compliance. And finally, we're pleased to have Kevin Sullivan with us today. Kevin is a client executive with National Trust Insurance Services, which is the insurance subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So uh, with that, I look forward to hearing from you, Kevin, and we'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, y'all. Hi, everybody, I appreciate your time. Uh, needless to say, uh, this is a large issue. I think there's uh, record attendance for this webinar. and. Uh, I think we're all probably experiencing the same level of pain. So the goal of today is just kind of overview the issue. We're not going to solve any problems on, on the call today, but uh, hopefully you'll leave educated and armed with information to uh, take back and solve, um, help solve the problem. You can go to the next slide, Jackson. 
So the, the headlines are out there. We've all seen it. There's a reason you're spending an hour of your day to get on this call. Um, the insurance marketplace is extremely chaotic and challenging and has been pretty much since uh, coming out of COVID, uh, the days of COVID, the dark days of COVID, I should say, in 2020. Um, so I'm going to explain why that's the case um, and uh, hopefully uh, answer some questions you have rattling around your head. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so in a nutshell, what you're looking at is the issue, right? So if you turn on the nightly news, uh, no matter which nightly news you watch, uh, they're either leading with a political story or they're leading with a natural disaster. It's pretty much that only one of those two things. Um, and what's happened since uh, uh, 2020 is the number of billion dollar weather events that have affected our country have have gone up to record levels. And, and I'll show you a graphic in the next slide that'll explain it. But for the, for the moment, what you're looking at is things that you see, you know, on the lead story of the nightly news, whether it's a hurricane, uh, wildfires that were affecting a big part of our country, or wind uh, events that kind of scrape through the middle part of our country on a continual basis. Um, the number of billion dollar weather events has um, gone up considerably. Uh, Jackson, you can go to the next slide. And to put this graphic into kind of perspective, um, the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, um, did a study of the last uh, 42 years of data. So this, this data you're looking at is a, a couple years old, but the point still remains very true. Um, so if you look at the last 42 years of underwriting data, the number of billion dollar weather events that have occurred You'll see right there uh, in, the, in the middle of your screen, the years of 2020, 2021, and 2022 were among the top six worst years. So three consecutive awful years of billion dollar weather events. Now, what does that do, right? We used to say we're here for a reason, uh, you know, for, the, for the, how it affects the insurance market. Um, I, I wanna explain that on the next slide. So go ahead, Jackson. Okay. so. Uh, really can be boiled, I know you see six things on your screen, but it really is boiled down to three things. So uh, how does the insurance market react when um, the number of events like this um, affect them? So catastrophic losses, we just talked about that, billion dollar weather events that, that hit our country. Well, you may have heard the term reinsurance, perhaps you have not heard the term reinsurance and that's fine. Uh, insurance companies who you are insured with buy insurance for themselves. So an insurance company that, that um, you know, is exposed to particular areas that they might have concern about, whether it's coastal Florida or wildfire, por wildfire portions of Colorado or whatever it might be, they cap their exposure and they buy insurance for themselves. That's through the process of reinsurance. And the reinsurance market is particularly exposed to these areas of our country that are affected. Um, so the catastrophic losses have driven up the cost of reinsurance. So the insurance companies that you're insured with, their internal costs have gone up. Of course, they're not gonna absorb those costs. They're gonna pass those on to the consumer. So when you're seeing your rates go up every year, homeowners, commercial insurance rates, it's typically the expenses of your insurance company that they're passing through to you. Moreover, number three, four, and five there, they're kind of all tied together. The, the cost, really since 2020, the cost of insurance claims has skyrocketed. That's the cost of labor, the cost of construction materials. And really what's happened is insurance carriers have realized that their book, their book of business, property insurance, homeowners insurance is underinsured. They've realized that the cost to handle claims, you know, to rebuild a house that once cost $800,000 to rebuild, is now costing 1.2 million. So they're recognizing that they need to not only increase, um, well, they're, they have to increase their, the, the underlying limits. So you're, not only are you seeing your rates go up, but you're seeing the, um, the limits go up as well. And we're gonna get dive into that a little bit more deeply um, later. For the moment, that's the very high level explanation of what's happening in the market. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan, who's gonna take it from here. Thanks, Kevin. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I will start by saying that if someone asked me 12 months ago or so if I wanted to talk about insurance, 
I probably would have said I'd rather watch paint dry. But here I am. Um, so I thought I'd start by telling you, like, why do I care about this issue so much? And why are we talking about this issue today, right now in 2024? So as a, you know, as a consultant with New History, as a real estate developer with Jill Pine, as an advocate for historic preservation, I have the same mission. And that mission is always to place more of these buildings back in service and increase the use of historic buildings. So I'm typically working with commercial real estate. I'm typically working with public and private owners to find solutions for these buildings. And oftentimes I'm using tools like historic tax credits or other historic preservation related funding sources. And I will say, you know, insurance was a word that I knew about, I knew we needed it, and it was just part of the process. Then within about the last 12 months, it has all of a sudden risen to be one of the biggest barriers that we're talking about to placing these buildings back in service. That's why I, that's why I care, and that's why I wanted to be a part of this webinar today. Um, I'm going to take the next two slides to talk through why this is so important right now and try to frame the problem from a commercial real estate perspective. So Jackson, if you could go to that first slide. So what I'm trying to do here is talk about how insurance fits into the historic building redevelopment of a project. And there's a lot going on here. And part of, I think the bottom line in this slide for me is that historic buildings just don't fit into the usual vocabulary of insurance. And part of the challenge I think we have is finding the right words to talk about insurance for historic buildings. So. This slide shows four, four bar graphs, if you will, that represent project costs for creating a new construction project on the left or historic building on the right. So starting on the new construction side, you know, how did it used to be? Um, 2019, pre-pandemic, the, the premise of being a real estate developer is that I'm, I'm taking land, I'm acquiring land, I'm adding value to it through hard costs, that's construction, through soft costs, that's all of my other... Um, professional fees and permits that I'm using to create my building. And at the end of the day, the market value that I've created on that land is more than what I just put into it from a money perspective, a time perspective, as well as my blood, sweat, and tears. So that is that is the reason why we do real estate development is to create a return on that investment. So you'll see market value there at the top of that graph. What's happened in the last couple of years, which is why I say 2024, to, just to the right of that, is we've seen, and Kevin hit on some of these things, we've seen a lot of rising costs in the labor market. We've seen rising costs in construction, materials, uncertainty. All of those things is making it harder and harder to do projects. And so what developers are doing is they're taking a lower return on their time and investment. It's also meaning that the, the whole marketplace is slowing down. Now we take new construction and compare that to historic development. And what does historic development look like? Well, pre-pandemic in 2019, that's my my um, starting point here. We, as developers of historic buildings, we know that oftentimes we are acquiring a building for less than maybe we would if it was a new construction project, because oftentimes these are distressed and blighted buildings. We're going to invest in them in terms of our construction costs and our soft costs. Our soft costs are typically higher because a lot of times we're paying more for labor and figuring out the building. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of times the market value of the completed project is less than what I've just invested in the building to put it back in service. And so you'll see that arrow for market value is lower than the total amount just I just invest in this building. And this is why we have programs like historic tax credits, because historic tax credits credits are theoretically, and the reason we have them at all since the 1970s is to make up that difference between what it's going to cost us to place these historic buildings back in service and what their value is at the end of the day. So what's happened lately in 2024, we've seen costs go through the roof in terms of construction and other costs associated with these projects. So now, even with historic tax tax credits, we're not able to make these projects happen. So that's where you see on the far right, our cost of doing historic building redevelopment is even far and above what we can do with historic tax credits alone. So now we start laying in other resources like low income housing tax credits, like investment tax credits, like tax increment financing. And we're using every tool we can possibly find to make these historic buildings work. So how does that translate to insurance? Well, on the left hand side, going back to new construction, if I lose my building through a weather event or otherwise, as Kevin mentioned, I need to talk to my insurance company about replacing that building. 
and on the new construction side, that's a pretty easy calculation to do because I've just, not necessarily just, but I've built the building. So I know my hard and soft costs and it's worth it to me because rebuilding the building will bring back a resource and it will have market value that is, is more than I've just paid to rebuild that building. So there's an incentive to do so. On the other hand, with historic redevelopment, I bought the building typically for a very low basis, again, because it's blighted or distressed. But still, even though I bought it for a very low, very low basis, it has an incredible amount of materials, craftsmanship, maybe things that we couldn't even build anymore. And it is extremely hard to quantify what that what that is and what's embodied in that historic building that I just got for you know maybe a dollar. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I bought it for a low basis. So when I go talk to the insurance company and we try to quantify, well, what happens if I lose this building? The replacement cost, we don't even know what number to put to that. Um, and from an insurance perspective, they're asking me to insure the building at that replacement cost. But at the end of the day, that replacement cost is far above what the market value of that building might be. So there's a, there can be a mismatch, order of magnitude mismatch between what we're insuring the building for and what it actually might be worth. So that's the project perspective. Um, and then I want to go into the operating side a little bit. So Jackson, if you would go to the next slide. So once we've placed the building in service, now what does it mean to have insurance through the operating years of the building? So this is a graph to show on the left-hand side money and on the horizontal axis, this is time. And just to put this in scale, I'm showing about eight years of time here. So when we first place our building back in service, we are immediately paying all of the expenses to operate this building, but we're in a what we call a stabilization period, meaning we're, we're leasing the building up. And we can think of this as being specific to housing, for example. So we're putting tenants in there, we're putting residences in, residents in there, and it's going to take some time to stabilize this building. So we know in that first year that there will never be enough money to cover the cost of our operating our building, and certainly not enough money to cover the cost of insurance. So we're going to be going negative and using what we call reserves. But then over time, again, the whole idea of real estate is that over time, your revenue, that light blue line, is going to climb just slightly faster than the black line. So that over time, you are you know, improving this building and creating a financial asset. So what happens when we have something like insurance that we aren't expecting to increase as much as it has in the last couple of years? And that's the dotted red line here is that we go what we say upside down on our building and so our expenses of operating this building are exceeding what we can generate from an income perspective and especially in the housing market there's a real um, challenge to generating revenue on these buildings because we might have limitations around affordability or frankly the community just might have limits about what rent is viable in that community so when we get into a situation where our costs to operate the historic building exceed what we can generate from the building, there's not a lot of room to move there when the, the margins are so slim already, I'll say especially around housing. So what that means, what that translates to is, you know, building owners can't afford to maintain their building. We have a hard time convincing developers to do these projects at all. We have a hard time getting historic tech credit investors to the table. And so we, we see an overall um, lack of projects happening. So I think for me, the, the summary of all of this is that we, I think everyone here, um, if you're joining this webinar, you agree with me that we need to be able to reuse these historic buildings. We need them for housing. We need them for environmental reasons. We need them for sustainability reasons. We need them for jobs. We need them for economic development. And there's a lot of, I'll say, local and federal policy that supports that premise of keeping historic buildings in use. I'll say, except, and there's a big exception here, except the insurance industry, who's not on board with keeping these buildings in use. And that's why we're having this webinar today. Um, so Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you to, to carry the conversation from your perspective. Sounds good, thanks, Megan. So hi guys, I am uh, Stephanie Cherry Farmer. I'm the Director of the Office of Documentation and Compliance for the Georgia Historic Preservation Division. And we're Georgia's State Historic Preservation Office. So that means we're the state agency that administers state and federal government historic preservation activities for the state of Georgia. And that includes nomination to and listing in the National Register. Uh, like Megan, you know, for a little perspective on why I care about this issue, I care about this issue because I'm hearing pretty consistently um, over my, my time here that um, insurance is becoming more and more difficult to obtain or obtain at reasonable rates. 
And I'm hearing that misinformation about the implications of national register listing, which is the pro one of the programs that I run, is uh, seems to be a key reason being given for the challenging insurance trends that we're seeing. This misinformation is potentially needlessly limiting both sides of the spectrum. Insurance companies are losing clients while clients have limited access to affordable insurance. And I say needlessly because uh, as we're gonna explore, uh, the National Register and National Register listing have no implications on the how, how insurance relates to a building. But I care because this is a huge hindrance to effective historic preservation planning and for about we should all care about that. And I think we all do. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Next slide, please. So what are state historic preservation offices hearing about historic property insurance issues and how are these offices involved in this discussion? Well, there, we've definitely seen a recent uptick in inquiries regarding obtaining property insurance for historic properties at reasonable rates. And uh, there's not always clarity on what historic means. As many of us know, historic can be used in many different ways. It can mean simply a building that is 50 plus years of age. It can mean a building that is locally designated. It can mean a building that is national register listed. But in many cases, we are hearing that because the property is listed in the national register, that is the reason for insurance challenges, either the, uh, the inability to obtain insurance or insurance rates increasing. The details of the concerns that we're hearing have evolved over the past few years. We used to receive a lot more concerns regarding single family homes, indicating that companies simply would not insure national register listed properties. Today, we're not hearing so much that companies won't insure them, rather we're hearing that the premiums that companies are charging are substantially elevated because the property is national register listed. And recently we've heard far more from multifamily properties, condo buildings specifically than single family ones. One of the most recent inquiries we received was from a condominium association in Atlanta. The condos are in a school building that was converted to residential use in the 1980s and has been listed in the national register since that time. So 35 years it's been listed. However, within the past six months, they were told by their insurance company that their insurance premiums are about to increase multi-thousand dollars because the property is listed. So spoiler alert, the reality is that being listed in the National Register of Historic Places by law is not regulatory. So listing is irrelevant to the treatment of a building, including repair or replacement. So from a State Historic Preservation Office perspective, continued misconceptions about what the National Register does and does not do, despite it being fairly uh, straightforward and spelled out in federal regulation, um, that's where I feel that, that state historic preservation offices can potentially have a very direct impact on this issue, continuing to educate people about what the National Register does and does not do. Demystifying this program is a big part of what I do every day. And I know we have many people on this call who may or may not work with historic resources every day. So I did wanna do just a quick 101 on the benefits of the National Register and why it's really critical to disentangle the issue of property insurance from the National Register of Historic Places. National Register listing should be something that historic property owners are encouraged to take advantage of, not discouraged to pursue. Next slide, please. This is because only National Register listed resources qualify for the federal and state tax and historic preservation tax incentives that support rehabilitation that Megan mentioned. So if a resource cannot get listed in the National Register or is discouraged from listing in the National Register, then it does not have the opportunity to take advantage of those critical federal and state historic preservation tax incentives that are the reason a lot of these buildings are getting put back into productive use and surviving, as Megan mentioned. So reason number one, we have to ensure that we can get more properties listed so that we can get more properties rehabilitated. Listing also provides visibility to a resource, documenting and verifying that it is historic and that the story that it tells is significant. And that creates a leg to stand on in terms of community advocacy for that resource's protection. More formally, this helps to ensure that properties are taken into account in federally funded, licensed, or permitted projects under what many of you may more commonly know as Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. 
eligible properties are accounted for as well, but listed properties kind of uh, have a leg up in that formula because they're already listed. So it's already determined that they are historic and that those projects need to account for their impact on them. Additionally, listing in the National Register opens the door to many federal grant opportunities, including things like the underrepresented communities grants and African-American civil rights grants that the NPS is offering now. And these are mo yet more financial incentives that can mean the difference between whether a resource continues to exist or not. And again, those are only available to listed properties. So National Register listing, if you take one thing away from what I'm saying today, it's that National Register listing does not place any obligations or restrictions on the treatment, use, transfer, or disposition of private property. And that's what we really want to ensure that we are educating the public and insurance companies about so that we can hopefully begin to break down this barrier that seems to indicate that the National Register is creating some sort of restriction whereby insurance companies are, are seeing a bigger risk. Next slide, please. So what are state historic preservation offices doing to help spread this message and debunk these myths? So as a state historic preservation office, we are precluded from advocating. So what we are doing is what we, what we can at the state government level, which is education, education, education. Many state historic preservation offices are providing formal letters, some to insurance companies and some to property owners to give to their insurance companies. These memos often refer back to guidance available from the National Park Service regarding the lack of insurance implications relative to the National Register. I've included in the slides here a citation to the National Park Service's National Register Program website, which includes a handy frequently asked question, are there insurance implications of a house being listed in the National Register? And the NPS verifies for us, no. I've also included a link to the federal regulations governing the program, which established the program parameters. These are the two resources that I am most routinely sending to constituents to help them educate and hopefully have informed conversations with their insurance providers. Some state historic preservation offices have suggested that owners facing insurance challenges contact their state insurance commissioner with questions regarding their commissioner's awareness of and involvement in this issue. And I think we'll see a lot more conversations with state insurance commissioners in the coming months and years. Many state historic preservation offices, including Georgia, are already working directly with their respective state insurance commissioner on this issue. Inspired by other states, Georgia is currently working with our Office of Insurance and Safety Fire Commissioner to craft a standard memo that carries the support of both offices. And we're doing that because some states have reported that a letter or a memo attributed to both agencies because it holds some weight from both agencies has made a difference in conversations with their insurance providers. The main points of our memo are, you guessed it, national and state register listings do not place restrictions on private property owners. They, have, they carry no owner obligation to restore properties or to maintain them in a particular way. And if a listed property is destroyed or damaged, it would be handled just as would any other property for the purposes of insurance because the National Register is non-regulatory. So there exists no requirements for replication or replacement of features, use of like materials, et cetera. And the National Register program has no review purview. The language here does have to be clear because if a historic property is damaged, a repair should ideally meet the Secretary of the Interior standards, including repair of materials and features in kind. But there is no requirement emanating from the state or federal government that requires this. And we're going to get in uh, to a little bit more detail in just a little bit in our Q&A about the difference between na the National Register and state registers and local historic preservation designation. But understand just for the purposes of this part of the presentation, if your insur insurer is telling you that the National Register is placing a regulatory restriction on your property and that's their concern, there are resources available to help you educate them that the National Register is non-regulatory. We're happy to share the template of our memo and ours is based on examples shared by other state historic preservation offices, so I know other states are willing to share as well. And that's a good thing for anyone listening to consider as a resource. So in some state historic preservation offices are very aware of this issue and we are working with our statewide and national preservation advocacy partners to educate about the realities of the National Register and property insurance. 
and ensure accurate information is available and circulating. And to that end, I really appreciate the opportunity to join this discussion today as part of that effort. And I'm really personally grateful to the National Trust for, for all that they are doing to tackle this issue. So I'm gonna hand it off to you, Shaw, for our Q&A. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, you know, thanks to all the panelists for a really uh, great overview. And we wanted to designate uh, a bit of time to for Q&A. Um, one of the questions that we received right off the bat, and a lot of folks are probably wondering about uh, the legality of, of uh, of, of uh, denying insurance if, if a property is on the National Register or you know, what recourse folks may have if their insurance company um, just decides out of the blue to drop them from that. So we, we wanted to start with that basic question and, and respond to it. Um, and you know, again, we wanna encourage uh, our panelists to jump in and, and offer thoughts, uh, but I'll direct this one first to, to Kevin and, uh, and, and start there. All right, it's a great question. It's a, it's a quick question, I gotta say. Um, it's not illegal um, to, um, I guess we'll use the word discriminate against the property that is on the historic registry. It's an approved and common, um, Underwriting consideration, you know, the age of the building, you know, insurance companies want to know the age of the building. If they feel the building's too old for whatever reason they determine, um, then they might decline. It's no different than the condition of the roof or the condition of the electrical system or plumbing system or the geography, what part of the country you're in. Um, so there's, you know, dozens and dozens of underwriting considerations that are taken, uh, including the occupancy of the building. Um, so yeah, being on the registry is is uh, definitely uh, uh, eligible for consideration. That's a helpful clarification, uh, especially considering Stephanie's point about um, uh, uh, just the, the register not requiring any particular activity, but it is within insurance companies' discretion to use that as, uh, as, a, as a basis for, for denying coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, um, Megan, that we, we saw a lot of questions come in before the webinar just around uh, replacement costs exceeding appraised value. And, and you did do a great job explaining that, but perhaps we can take a moment here to just uh, dive a little bit deeper into that issue of, of uh, uh, appraisal value and replacement value for, for historic properties. And there was actually a specific question as well, Shaw, that came in about replacement value and what the assumptions are for historic buildings. So I think this is a, I think I can start the uh, response here and Kevin, I'm sure would have some additional information to add to this. So I'll, I'll actually just use a, a case study in terms of numbers to kind of put this in perspective. So for a, a recent building redevelopment that I, I worked on, the, the building was essentially acquired for next to nothing. It had been vacant for, for 20 plus years. It's a building type that's obsolete. So then as a development team, we're investing in this case, $11 million to turn this building into housing, workforce housing. That $11 million that I put into the building to create this housing is worth, according to the local tax assessor, it's only worth $4 million at the end of the day. From an insurance perspective, when I have it appraised, they look at the building and to get to the question from the, the audience member, they look at what would it cost to physically rebuild this building as it was. And that includes you know, tons of granite that was quarried locally. It includes over 100 tons of steel. It includes decorative plaster. It includes terrazzo. It includes stone carvings. And they come up with a number of $21 million if I were to rebuild this building. So now as a as a person who's trying to put these buildings back in service, I've got a building that's worth $4 million, but I have to insure it for $21 million. So from a, th that's where I was trying to make the point that there's, we don't quite have the right vocabulary to talk about historic buildings when it comes to insurance. And I think, Kevin, I'd love to hear your opinion on how we can, how we can insure the building for what I'm going to say is functional value, meaning I have 31 homes that I'd like to insure and make sure that those are still around, but there's no way I'd ever be able to 
rebuild or even want to rebuild that kind of behemoth of an obsolete building that I started with. Yeah, that, you know, it's a great point and you're absolutely correct. I'll, I'll give you the kind of the devil's advocate position. Uh, I, I don't work for an insurance company, but I work with them on a daily basis. And their concern is um, collecting enough, um, well, premium, connecting, collecting enough to contemplate what it would cost if something happened to that building, right? So market value is meaningless to an insurance carrier. If you had a average structure, you know, frame, 2,000 square foot structure, and you put it in Times Square, the market value would be, you know, millions and millions of dollars. You take that same building, you pick it up, and you put it in Lincoln, Nebraska, the market value is completely different. Insurance companies don't care about market value. They care about what happens if that structure were to burn down and the owner of that building choose to replace it. So they focus on replacement value, and you covered it perfectly well. Uh, which is what's the cost to replace it? Another question I saw in the Q and A as I was skimming it was: Are historic buildings do they need a higher replacement value than, let's say, a modern building? Uh, I think that's the spirit of the question. And the answer is yes, of course, for the for all the reasons that Megan pointed out: the the quality of materials, the availability of materials, the type of artists and contractors that are qualified to do that level of work. Right. I mean, just if you just focus on plaster walls as opposed to drywall, plaster is more expensive. It's harder to do. Oak floors as opposed to pine. You know, everything in a historic building is uh, more challenging. And the old adage that always rattles around my brain, which I think everybody on this call has heard at some point, which is, you know, that old saying, they don't build it like they used to. Right. Like that's true. You know, the, 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 the quality of construction way back when is superior to modern methods. So insurance companies who do insure historic buildings are very aware of that. And um, they, they tend to make sure that um, they, they're insured properly. As Megan pointed out, a $4 million market value versus a $20 million um, replacement value. That's a real issue, right? So maybe we spin it. That's the perspective from the insurance company. How do you take it from the perspective of the consumer who's got this very real issue? And I wish I had a solution, like a simple solution for you, but it really comes down to just shopping the insurance. And, you know, there's a lot of different types of policies out there. There's policies that insure to replacement standards for historic replacement costs. You can also get policies that aren't as good, but they might serve your purpose. They might serve your need, which is insuring something at a functional replacement cost or an actual cash value. Right. So there's 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 variations in terms of what you buy. If you bought a functional replacement cost policy that the carrier, you know, an insurance policy is a contract. The, the contract says they're going to fix it at a functional value, not not historic, but functional for people on this call. Functional means as cheaply as possible. <laughs> it's like no plaster. Here's your drywall. No oak floors. Here's your pine. Right. Aisle 13 of Home Depot is kind of where they'll send you. And um, but if that's your goal. That's, that's your goal, and that's fine, too. I, you know, everybody's not lumped together. So there, there's a lot of different ways you can go about uh, doing it. Thank you uh, for those very helpful responses. Uh, there's a question that came in about how do designations uh, like local landmarking and conservation easements impact insurance rates for historic properties? And, and I saw another question about... Um, you know, distinctions between individual properties and districts. Uh, uh, are the insurance uh, carriers also, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, discriminating against districts as well and not just individual properties? So so perhaps uh, local landmarking, conservation easements, and and local districts as a, as a category. Yeah, so I, I think I can to, start that. Do you want to, then, sure, yeah, okay. Faster. I was just going to say, do you want well, me to I'll start from the insurance by... perspective? And then... okay. Perfect. Actually, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. You're right. Yeah, you go ahead and start off by, by explaining the difference for everybody. Okay, so um, I just because not everybody does this every day, and this is the the key me, key misconception. This is really why there's misconception about the National Register because there exists this local system of designation as well. Local zoning ordinances are the mechanism whereby a city a municipality or a county designates a historic resource. 
as a local landmark under a local zoning ordinance again. And these are often regulatory. So this is a designation that has teeth, right? In, in many cases, right? Not always. The specifics of what uh, of how properties uh, are regulated or not is is very case by case based on the specifics of the local ordinance. Um, but understand that uh, I think that's kind of the root of the misconception when people hear register or designation, there's a uh, constant confusion between the difference between local designation versus the national register. The national and state register, the, the national register is, is a program of the federal government. The federal government does not have a regulatory uh, say in how those properties are treated or maintained. Whereas the uh, local designation is a product of a local zoning ordinance. And of course that is regulatory land use at the local planning level. So, so for anybody that might not do this every day, that's the difference. A conservation easement is a totally different tool wherein you have uh, usually uh, it's it's a private tool whereby you have um, uh, given over uh, some right to the property in order to uh, ensure that or, or some for, for a tax write-off essentially and that property is then protected via a private conservation easement so that is also a tool that could have regulatory implications so that's really the key difference conservation easements and local landmarking could have regulatory implications that control what happened to that property physically. The National Register does not. How do those impact insurance, Kevin? <laughs> that was a great segue. I'm glad we, we took that route because that that's that's exactly right. So it's it's the regulatory issue, that it's the topic of regulatory that insurance companies have a problem with. So I'm going to put on my kind of Mr. Insurance Company hat and say, you know, how, why, how insurance carriers think about this issue, having worked with them for, um, you know, a decade or more. The, the issue is a misconception. I mean, that's as simple as it put. Most insurance carriers should choose not to insure buildings that are on the historic registry do so because they think wrongly that there is some sort of regulatory requirement on their part to um keep a certain level of quality or standards that keeps with the, the department of the interior so they might think you know again an insurance policy is a contract and the contract might say you know we are going to insure you mr customer on a functional replacement cost basis so you paid a premium contract we're all we're all in agreement right but then this claim happens to your historic building the insurance companies wrongly think that they're going to be forced to not honor their contract, which is frankly cheaper for them, functional replacement, and instead be required to do historic quality, right? Plaster, oak floors, stained glass windows, whatever it might be. That misconception, in my opinion, is the root of the issue because mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact that there's a lot of insurance companies who just have this, you know, rubber stamped policy. Oh, it's a historic registry. Uh, we don't do those, right? Well, why not? Well, we don't want to be pulled into, you know, having to do something like so. It's a misconception that is that's pretty common. But as it relates to things like easements, um, it, you know, there is there's no like there's no pricing consideration. So I'll just say it one more way: for the carriers that do insure historic properties, historic registers, it's not a pricing tool. Meaning, it it it. it, it there's not a line item on the policy that says, here's your upcharge for being on the historic registry. It's just, they feel that there might be an opportunity to charge more money. So, and it's one consideration, but there's other considerations we started to talk about, right? The roof, the plumbing, the electrical, those are the real kind of things. So um, at the end of the day, remove the kind of historic element of the building. If your building's a good quality updated building, like what Megan does to her buildings, right? They're high quality, fully renovated, um, those are buildings that are desirable, but even still, even if you have a desirable building, that one, you know, check box of it's on the historic registry, unfortunately, still keeps some insurance markets away. So hopefully that answers the question. And and I would just uh, follow up with, I think for anybody listening, it's it's always important to understand exactly what is the challenge that you're being told by the insurance company, but also the specifics of your building. And I'm telling people all the time, you know, know what, uh, what is your building locally designated, you know, have a relationship with your local planning office, particularly if they have historic preservation staff. 
Um, that is one of the ways that I think we're going to be able to potentially fight this is um, by collecting information from different sources and something like your local planning office, which is who would administer a local preservation or ordinance or local designations. That's a great source of information to figure out how are resources that are locally designated in your city or county uh, dealing with insurance? You know, what are comparables and other owners uh, or projects that you might speak to about how to tackle insurance issues if you're coming up against them? So I definitely think local planning ordinances and the local preservation arm are a great uh, additional resource for information. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Um, and just just to clarify one of that that finer point that came in, uh, individually listed and districts treated mm -hmm. the same way by the insurance carriers, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, the, I wish they did that level of uh, thought, you know, it's not like a, they don't ask that level of uh, delineation, they just kind of they don't even know the right terminology to be honest with you. So they don't even really know what they're asking a lot of the times. I'm not going to say all the times, but oftentimes they just ask very blanket, poorly worded questions about is it on the you know is it on the register? And you're like, well, what, well, well, you you know expand. So, um, but yes, typically there's no difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a question for for Megan. Uh, uh, it notes that. Uh, Folks are having trouble with insurance companies refusing to even give valuations uh, when you need to get quotes. And I've heard you mention this before that it's just even tough to get a response. Um, any, uh, aside from just being dogged in your pursuit, is there uh, any approaches that uh, you now employ to uh, have companies respond, get the best deal, and, and perhaps Kevin, if any any thoughts on that would be helpful, but clearly uh, working with an insurance partner who knows the terminology and understands these distinctions is helpful. But uh, Megan, first first to you for any strategies that you, you are now employing. I wish I had the silver bullet. Um... But I'll I'll start off by a little bit of context here, um, and Kevin can uh, add more to this as well. But at this point in time, uh, you know, insurance is a private marketplace, and insurance companies can set whatever criteria they would like for their analysis of the buildings. Um, because it is a private marketplace, decisions change, and I'll say analysis change. And if several years ago, and Kevin can add more specific details here, there were more insurance providers who were willing to look at historic buildings. I think part of the challenge we're having right now and why we're talking literally right now is because more and more insurance providers are misunderstanding or you know, pulling out of the historic building market. So I think part of our challenge right now is just that we have a very, very limited supply with you know, you know Kevin being one of our resources in terms of, of insurance. I think that there's um, if you're in your local community, you know, certainly connecting with an insurance broker who may have the right words to use, um, being educated yourself about the right words to use. To Stephanie's point, understanding what um, jurisdictions you're subject to or not in terms of what the local preservation ordinance whether it applies to you, but also what it means to you. I mean, just being locally designated doesn't necessarily mean you have to rebuild your building in the way it was originally. So I think there's, I think the first point is or the first step is to arm yourself with the information you need to have an informed conversation, which is why I think we're we're having this conversation today. That's that's kind of step one is to get the right terms and then to find the right allies and advocates in the industry. Stephanie mentioned some, you know, Kevin is one, your insurance brokers are others. But I think at this point, the reality of where we are is that our resources are limited because there just are limits to the insurance providers who are willing to come to the table and talk about this. Yeah, I'll, I'll expand on that. That's excellent, uh, excellent point. And really well said. Uh, the uh, I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and just you know the term appraisal, right? Uh, if anybody's ever bought or sold a home, you know, or you got a loan from a bank, you have to get a market value appraisal. What what's my, what's my house worth, right? If I wanted to sell it, market value appraisal. Take that thought and throw it out because we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is replacement cost appraisal, which is important to the insurance carriers. They want to know. Uh, well, has an expert looked at it and has an expert weighed in to say what your building would cost to rebuild, right? 
and that's that's important to insurance companies. Um, for you, the consumer, it's important too, right? You'd like to know what it would cost to rebuild my house or my building or whatever it might be. But, you know, let's kind of uh, tongue in cheek here. Like you also think that there's an association with a limit and your premium, right? We all think that. It's fair to think that. If you have a building that you uh, want to insure for $2 million, you think you could, you know, have some, you know, your premium, what you pay, will be here. But if someone's telling you you got to insure the building for $4 million, then you're thinking, well, then my premium is going to do that. And nobody, myself included, wants to pay more in insurance than they have to pay, right? So the topic of what to insure your building for, what limit to use, is big for a lot of reasons. Curiosity, financial, everything. There, in every community, you can find a market value appraiser, right? Because people buy and sell houses all, all throughout the country. But a profession that is really isn't as popular, I guess I'll say, is uh, replacement cost appraisers. The experts that will look at a building and say, I don't care about the market value, I just care about, all right, I'm gonna examine the square footage, the materials, the quality, everything, I'm gonna tell you what it's gonna cost. So if your building collapses tomorrow, here's a document that'll tell you how much it'll cost to rebuild it. So there really isn't a lot of resources out there in terms of professions. Insurance companies have their in-house experts um, that they use for their own underwriting purposes. This is more common in the homeowner's world. And they don't want to share that with the consumer um, because they view it as their proprietary information, right or wrong. They view it as their proprietary knowledge and information. Um, there's not a lot of third-party experts out there that can do it. There are some um, that can do it, but not a lot. Um, and then there's some online resources, right? Like there's something called Marshall and Swift, which is like an online kind of thing where you punch in a couple keystrokes of here's my square footage, here's my zip code, blah, 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 and it might give you a recommendation. But at the end of the day, is it accurate? I'm not, I'm not so sure. So it is an important topic. Um, it's probably one of, the, one of the important topics in all of building insurance, not just historic, but all. Um, and it, there's very few resources you can get from the insurance company or from um, third parties. Egan, you take it away here. I just wanted to end, Kevin, so we've been or end this question rather, we've been talking so much about replacement value that I think that there's there's a missing conversation at the table, which is, you know, we use these buildings, we need to use these buildings, and we're not talking enough about how we can use them and occupy them and what they're, and how to ensure that functional value, because I think that's the missing middle in terms of what, to Stephanie's point, what do you have to do to these buildings? Do you have to bring them back to their, I'll say their original construction? Probably not. It really depends on the municipality. Um, even with you know a housing project that I create, I've I've agreed to deliver to a city a certain number of housing units. They don't care if they're in the historic building or I just need to provide those housing units. And there's a huge gap in the middle that I think we're missing in terms of you know full replacement value over here and like just using these buildings and keeping them in service for what we we need them to do. That's true, but. Uh... 100% true. And from your um, scope of, you know, your norm, your expertise, you're, you're right. I also just don't want to um, dismiss um, other sides of the preservation community, whether it's like house museums or historical societies that are more, that don't have that, um, I don't know if I'm going to use the right term, but like financial mindset. They're more like in the true preservationist mindset of like the history, right? So if uh, part of the, this historic building, George Washington was, you know, got his first tooth pulled in this building and it's, and it's a great significance for the community and um, a tree falls on a portion of it and you've got 80% of the building, a historic building that's undamaged and 20% that's damaged. How do I fix it using the same material? So what's important um, to some is not important also. And there is no wrong answer. I'm not saying that there is. I just want to make acknowledge that, um, that's why, to make Megan's point, uh, the options should be out there. For depending on what your end goal is, um, there should be a, a insurance option for you. Um, and there is, but it's limited. That's the point. It's limited. It's not to say there's no market. It's just a very limited market. And you know, I know we're running running low on time, but the um, the first couple slides I talked about with like the state of the insurance market, right? Boom, you know, billion dollar events. 
we're in, everybody's in this. If this isn't a historic building problem, this is a property insurance problem, homeowners insurance problem. We're, we're a small subset of that. Um, but hopefully, you know, markets go up, markets go down. Hopefully we can find ourselves easing out of the issues our country faces and maybe the market will open up. So just wanted to say that. I like the, uh, the slightly positive spin on that as a, as a good <laughs> moment to uh, just thank all of you uh, for your time and expertise today. Um, as as you can see, you know we've received hundreds of questions uh, uh, leading up to the webinar, hundreds uh, 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 during the webinar, and this is a topic that the National Trust will continue to to focus on and. And work through, but I hope for our audience, you you start to get a sense of uh, the complexities around the issue, what's driving some of these issues, um, and and what what on the horizon might might change it or uh, you know alter the marketplace, which which time will tell. But um, let me, uh, if we can. Uh, bring back our remaining slides as we close out. I'll, I'll just note that um, we will follow up and, and, and try to batch the questions that we've received and, and continue to provide answers. But I think as our, as our panel has so eloquently stated, it's about educating. And uh, the more we can do there, uh, I think the better positioned uh, historic preservation insurance will be. So I wanted to note uh, our upcoming webinars, uh, July 25th, Monuments and Justice, Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument. That'll be from our uh, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund conversation series. And on August 28th, From Endangered Place to Community Asset, updates on three 11 most endangered historic places. Don't miss that one. And then we also wanted to point out um, that how many of these issues are wrapped up in the legal framework of historic preservation. And there is the historic, uh, the preservation law conference going on in Washington, D.C. on September 12th uh, that we would encourage you to uh, take a look and attend that. Uh, next slide, please. And we are very excited about our Pass Forward Conference coming up, celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the National Trust. This will be held in New Orleans on October 28th through 30th. Please register and join us for that event uh, at savingplaces.org backslash conference, and you are able to register there. Um, again, uh, as we close out, I want to thank our, our panelists for their time and expertise today. It really was such an informative discussion, and uh, I'm glad our Q&A function worked the way that it did. It did allow for a lot of good back and forth, so please leave us a comment on, on the format, and, uh, and uh, don't forget to post questions, uh, your question in the chat, and we will be sure to incorporate that into our follow-up. So with that, uh, we want to thank you one last time. Uh, here are some websites that you uh, uh, to reference materials, Preservation Leadership Forum there, and uh, more information on upcoming webinars. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and look forward to future conversations around historic property insurance. Thank you all. Thanks.